So I'm kind of expecting a bottom in the cycle in April. That that's the teeth of the recession. I think we're just going to go off a cliff now. I feel like Bitcoin's lost its narrative. And I just look at the chart and it's so similar to ETH in 2018. But either way, Polygon is doing really, really well as well. It's kind of, for me, it's that Polygon Solana nexus feels like if you invest in an ETH NFT, let's say, you get the ETH exposure. So if ETH goes from Mm. wherever we are today, 1700 and it goes to 3400 your nft might move around a little bit versus eth but generally speaking you get that eth appreciation you can Mm -hmm. see it all over twitter is everybody's so bruised from a bear market that everyone's like well i don't know i don't trust it you yeah, know, it's going to come yeah. back in my face as soon as I get hopeful. So I'm kind of expecting a bottom in the cycle in April. That that's the teeth of the recession. I think we're just going to go off a cliff now. But I think the market has priced this. You know, it kind of knows the recession. I mean, everybody knows the recession. I mean, okay, if liquidity does change, how does this play out? And I looked at previous times, and it depends. I mean, ETH is very closely following Bitcoin 2013. If that's the case now then we could get a a bigger spike and then a correction. If we're tracking the 2018, it's similar. I mean, it went up 283% and then spent six months coming down. Now, if I look back and remember what was happening in... So 2018, when it all took off, was the Powell pivot. He's like, okay, we stopped raising rates. People confuse it and say, thinking they cut rates. They didn't cut rates until September, August... And then they stopped QT in September. But up until about June, crypto rallied like crazy. And then it then corrected as the Fed started delivering on rate cuts. So it's kind of buy the rumor, sell the fact bit, and then started getting traction later. So somewhere in that is, you know, this two halves idea I, I kind of agree with. What was different about the 2013 example is it did a sideways range. It put this big flag pattern and then broke out again. While 2019 was that quite big correction, taking back quite a lot of the move. And then crypto ended up the year up 100%. I don't know which way it plays out, but what's going on in my head is, okay, fine, we've got these two examples. That's not a lot to go by, but we kind of, we've got a rough idea what we think it could do. But then I think about the market itself right now, and everybody is underweight. 18% of the entire market's in stables. Every hedge fund is gun shy. Retail are a bit like this. And we know the institutions did all of the work on allocation, stuff like that. And it feels that everybody's short the upside because the more it goes up, the more that they think, fuck, I need to pull the trigger. Now, maybe that gets the excess optimism or maybe it is so bullish because again if i think about the eth burn you know mm-hmm. if we're burning stuff in a in a small rally from the low imagine when participants actually really come back i mean we're going to end up with a lot of people wanting to buy eth and less and less eth every day coming onto the market i just think okay it might be different this time what that yeah. means i don't i don't know I know I don't stake because I don't want the illiquidity for a year and I don't want to use Lido or anything or Rocket Pool or whatever because A, it's complicated and B, um, there's another risk that I can't quantify. But if I can do easy, straightforward ETH staking at any time horizon, which is what the Shanghai Fork is, I'm going to stake my ETH. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to take gigantic amounts of ETH out of the market. Okay, so if you became unlocked today, would you sell ETH? No. Nobody's going to sell it. And I think there is a probability that is not small that this gets, that ETH actually gets unruly to the upside in a way that people don't expect. Because we are all expecting some sort of consolidation. We're all expecting... But if you get that moment in time where retail's piling in, there's activity going on as DeFi comes back, back in new forms, NFTs get going, and we've got reduced supply because of the staking, and we've got the burn. 
I mean, we could set ourselves up to something, this kind of tremendous crypto bubble. That There's a possibility of that, I think. It's not the most liked by some people and other people love it is Solana. The reason my simple thesis on Solana, you know, I'm very simple in these things, is like they clearly want to go and adapt, uh, adopt the hundred, you know, the, the, the next hundred million, 500 million, a billion people because they're consumer facing. They've got fucking stores. Mm -hmm. They've got a phone. You know, they've, they kind of get that side of things. And I just look at the chart, and it's so similar to ETH in 2018, 19, with this exact same drawdown. The price pattern's the same. Everyone's giving it up for dust. It's like, okay, that's interesting to me. I mean, they're doing great stuff. And, you know, Polygon as a layer two accrues some of the value to the layer one. I don't even know yet if we know how to value the layer twos yet. But, but either way, Polygon is doing really really well as well it's kind of for me it's that polygon solana nexus feels like if somebody's going to crack and um, yeah maybe flow there's other ones around but if anybody's going to crack scale it's that the other mm. one that's really interesting to me is sui mr mm. labs yeah because that is hugely fast and an amazing team and that kind of stuff so that comes yeah. out and that feels like it might be the Solana of this cycle. It's difficult. It is difficult for people to figure out what is what is worth getting involved in. But how I've thought about it as well, if you invest in an ETH NFT, let's say, you get the ETH exposure. So if ETH goes from mm. wherever we are today, 1700, and it goes to 3400, your NFT might move around a little bit versus ETH. But generally speaking you get that ETH appreciation. Now, if you get it right, so, you know, one of the reasons that I bought a punk recently was the fact that, okay, they're, they're about as cheap as they've been, and they're, like, stable at 65 ETH right now. They're like high-end property. So as the market goes up, they tend to outperform because people want to show off and they want to invest their ETH and they want to buy these things. So they, they tend to be a call option on, on the bull market. I still get the ETH exposure, but if I'm right and punks triple, which would go back to the high, then I get the ETH exposure tripled. Mm -hmm. and people don't understand this, which is why some of those grails, some of those art ones are potentially really good investments because what's the downside of a punk in ETH terms? 30%? What's the upside? 300%? That's a 10 for one on an asset that's already going up potentially 10 for one as well. 6529's meme cards have gone from virtually nothing to you know two ETH it's like oh my god these, are these 10 X's uh, yeah. or more I has anybody tokenized stuff like an ape yet because you know because with a scarce asset you can't fractionalize the price right I can't buy a fraction of an ETH but I can buy a fraction of a uh, fraction of an ape I can buy a fraction of an ETH so that's very that's very egalitarian because everybody can put 10% of their assets in regardless of how much money you've got but with a punk, you can't. Have people done that kind of stuff yet? So you can democratize access to even the rare assets in digital world? Because if not, it's kind of, we're still not doing our job properly. I feel like Bitcoin's lost its narrative. If we think about how things are valued in terms of Metcalfe's law, and this is valuation, not the philosophy of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you need the number of people using the network and the connections. And there's no connections on Bitcoin. Yes, we've got the lightning la layer that batches transactions. But, but there's nothing else being built on it in, in the same way. So by definition, it can't do as well. The other thing is that if you're an asset allocator and given the choice of ETH versus Bitcoin and the green narrative stuff, you're always going to take ETH because it yields. Yep. You get a 5% real yield after supply and um, you've got the access, you know, you, you're betting on the technology being adopted. Why, why would you not? So, yeah, I just feel like Bitcoin's floundering and it's it's actually getting narrower in its focus. Mm -hmm. you and can't. the network protectors have generally won out in, in Bitcoin's case all the time. So the people who, who don't want change have generally won out. And again, maybe in the long game that works. But, you know, in the next phase, I just don't see it working as well. I just don't think it's going to attract y y your uncle to invest in Bitcoin next time around. You know, he'll end up probably buying or getting an NFT, which is attached to ETH without even knowing about that he's got ETH exposure. You know, it's, yeah. it's going to be very interesting. You usually get an innovation bubble. 
then you get all the failures and stuff doesn't work. But out of that comes the learning and the next phase. And I feel that DeFi, given what happened to the centralized exchanges, and listening to Joey Krug at Pantera, who's like, this is the big theme for us. I think it makes sense. I, just, I don't even know where or what. You know, sure, you can own Uniswap and Aave or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, DXDY is another one that people are looking at. But it feels that there's a lot of innovation to come out of DeFi because people have been building, resolving issues, figuring out what goes wrong, what goes right. And I've never looked at this is percentage DeFi of the overall market and where it should be. Because, you know, yes, the, the modern system in traditional finance, actually the finance system actually became larger than the economy. And it still is to the day. But this that's an interesting dynamic to look at. Because I think, as you say, right now, particularly with the experience in DeFi and how difficult some of these things are still, that you can tell whether it's overshot because it shouldn't grow massively as a percent. The space needs to grow first. And then the opportunity to use DeFi once you've created stuff. So you can see it with ETH and ETH staking, which is why Lido and other stuff has done well, is that became something that there was enough people holding ETH and therefore there was demand for this. Mm-hmm. But until we get to that, we probably don't, DeFi can't massively outperform the market. I just think that layer one hype cycle, I just, I think it's really hard, particularly by the next phase of whatever the size ETH is at that mm-hmm. point and where Solana is and some of these other very active chains is how the, how the hell you as a brand or somebody who's using an application on top of Web3, how are you going to say, oh, you know what, I'm going to choose some random small chain right. when we still haven't abstracted away the wallets and everything else mm-hmm. to make it easy? You're just not going to take the risk. <laughs>